Aha! Hello! Long time no see. Can you hear me? Please unmute. Oh, it's just unmuted. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. She's not good afternoon, but good morning for her. Can you all say good, good morning? <laughs> yes, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon there. Can you see me okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, been able to hear you. Perfect, <laughs> perfect, perfect. So it's, it's nice to see you all in Singapore. Um, uh, I first of all, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this session. I'm always excited to talk about data governance, um, that it's very impactful and it's really an interesting part of your working life. Um, so without any further ado, um, I'll just do a brief introduction of myself and get into the presentation. Or I think you may maybe already introduced me. <laughs> Actually, no, but you know, um... Uh, how about I do a bit of introduction first, okay, Althea? All sure, right. sure. Althea is an old friend, and I really thank her for, for doing this. I, I guess I've known you for quite a few years, but yes. um, all those years, she's always had the word chief in front of her, chief data officer, chief data officer, I think too many, many times. And if I remember correctly, used to, uh, when I knew you, you were uh, part of ABN Emerald, right? Yes, yes. That's correct. Uh, head of the Center of Expertise in Data Management for ABN Emro. Uh, by the way, she's got uh, she's got something like a whole list about day long of all the <laughs> data. But this is only since I knew her, right? So ABN Emro, Head of Center of Expertise Data Management, Director of Data Strategy for RGP, Head of Enterprise Data and Information Management for the European Commission. So she knows GDPR very well. Uh, <laughs> Correct, yeah. Uh, she, she's the first one that told me about GDPR. You remember you yeah, messaged me? That's yeah. true. That's you true. Me, GDPR is coming. Don't play. It's going to be real. She did that. Uh, Chief Data Officer, then she went back to become Chief Data Officer of ABN Amro, Chief Data Officer of uh, IMG, so banks again for the bankers here. Uh, Global Data Governance Manager for Heineken, which, I, which came with, I think, benefits. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but I like I like this I like the apple cider more than the beer. Sorry. <laughs> Sad. Not okay, but never mind. Oops. Okay. Uh, I just lost the thing. Okay, let me get back. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I said, see, that was Heineken, and then she then you went over to the Middle East, and you were chief yes. global so oh, enterprise data governance manager at the heart. Yes, correct. And then Director of Data Practice, Data Strategy at NXN, and yes. then a Chief Data Officer at Abu Dhabi Digital Authority. Right? Yes, that's, that's correct. A long that's chat when you, when you did that. And then, of course, now you are CEO of your own uh, Athrara. Well, yes. Which is where everything you've learned, you're now going to actually make money and start working for the government and making other people. Uh, <laughs> But yeah. uh, so Althea has not only been, been, been in this, all of these many roles in there. She was voted as EDO Managing Data uh, Power Woman 2021 and 22. She's a board member of the MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers, CDO Magazine Editorial Chairwoman. Um, she was voted CDO of the year, 2022 by Women AI. She's also a global speaker many times. She, I think, follow her LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> she, where she posts everything, it's all about data and strategy, right? So it's not she's not a data skewer, data not data. She's actually strategically running organizations where data empowers organizations. I think so one of the right. major Fulbright Scholar, uh, MBA, all the nice uh, nice uh, uh, letters after her name, very long. Go check her link. <laughs> and with that, I like to. Uh, uh, welcome you to our Masters of General Leadership class. You see here, they're all still awake in the middle of the afternoon. Right. Uh, we'll check again after your talk. Right. So great, great. <laughs> all right. I'll let you, I'll let you uh, add, add anything else you want to add to that? Oh, <laughs> no, you did such a good job. Uh, enough about me. 
Um, the big the big speeches are coming up. Jitex here in the Middle East, if you know what that is, that's the big technology and AI innovation show. Leap in Saudi is coming back. I've talked at both of those and they're lots of fun. But enough about me. I know it's in the afternoon. So can I ask all of you one thing to start? Could we all just stand up and just, you know, just stand up? <laughs> I love it. Just, you know, get the blood moving so you can actually listen to me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, guys, I, I, first of all, again, thank you very much. I would really like this to be interactive. I was told I had an hour and a half, and I'm going to try my best to give at least half an hour at the end so that we can talk to each other. I would really like to know, what are you grappling with? What are you working on? What are you curious about? Um, and um, what you think about some of the things I've said. So it's really for me to share with you, but it's obviously much more important <laughs> that you actually can walk away from this talk with something uh, tangible, uh, enlightened, and something that you can do something with. So um, I'm going to pull up my presentation. So I hope I can share my screen. Just one moment. And please let me know when you can see my screen. Yes, yeah. yes? okay. I'm gonna just make this a bit smaller for myself. Okay, so we're here today to talk about strategic data governance. And there are many aspects of this, so I will do my best to make it insightful for you. So what we're going to start with today is where does data governance actually reside? You know, how is it residing in your organization and, and how do you get a grip on that? Then we're going to go into the area which is not as nice to talk about, but it's the things that you're actually dealing with. So we're going to deal with the white elephant in the middle of the room. We're going to talk about what hampers your ability to make data governance a reality strategically and also being impactful and how to blast away the adversities that you are dealing with. Okay. And I will give you advice, but I will also give you practical examples on all of the above. And then the most important one, I think, of this session is to get to get, to get the data governance job done from the strategic level right through to operationalizing it. This is actually where the rubber hits the road, where um, you're able to prove successes that data governance is really something tangible in the organization. It's not for the gray mice. It's not just about compliance. And even if you're doing it for compliance purposes, it's still impactful. Okay, it is very, very important. I'm going to show you some practical examples of real things that have been done, uh, things that you can take away. And then we're going to go into how does data governance coexist? So what am I talking about? In organizations, uh, doesn't matter if you work in the government or you work in commercial organizations, um, data governance coexists with all of the key strategies that you and I think about digitalization or um, uh, cyber or, uh, you know, customer um, uh, obsession uh, or compliance, whatever it is, it coexists. Now, how do you find the intersection between data governance and all the things that the business or the rest of the organization feels and deems as very important? Yeah, so how do you even get a seat at the table and how do you uh, make it, um, a reality for the organizations. So I'm gonna to try to time myself here, you guys, and keep, my, keep myself to my promise. So let's get started. So if we look at um, <clears throat> where does data governance reside? <clears throat> Excuse me, just one moment. <clears throat> where does gov data governance reside? Um, you want to actually uh, realize that you are not the first one at the dance. So what am I talking about? You have, you're in an organization, um, you've been tasked with uh, establishing data governance, but guess what? The organization already exists. 
people already are incumbent in their positions. They already think that things should be done a certain way. So you need to kind of, what I would call it, humble yourself and understand the lay of the land. And how do you best do this? It doesn't matter if you're in Singapore, Amsterdam, Abu Dhabi, or somewhere in Nairobi, it's always the same thing. The organization innately has what we call a uh, cultural organization, cultural trait. It fits into something. And what I'm suggesting to you is borrow from other disciplines in order to do the data job right. So what am I talking about? This is what I'm talking about. Uh, if we look at understanding context, when I speak to, to CDOs and I talk about, I talk to CDOs about doing their job right, I always say to them, understand what kind of CDO you need to be. What is your, your CDO challenge profile? So are you, uh, is there no CDO before you? Are you the new CDO? Are you a CDO in a maturing um, you know, environment? Or you're a CDO that's really focused on creating value because there's so much started. So this is a CDO trying to understand their context. Just like that CDO advice, I would advise you to know the organization culture. So what is this picture I'm showing you? It is a diagram. This diagram has been redone and refitted, I think, every single decade. Originally, it came out, I believe, in 2000 and uh, in the 2000, sorry, in, in the, what is it now, the, the 1980s, I'm sorry, the 1980s. And it had to do with understanding the foundations of the organization. So if you look at these four quadrants, you see at the top cultural type, it says top left, clan. There's another cultural type on the top uh, right called adhocracy. And there's another one at the bottom left called hierarchy, as well as bottom right called market. Now, if you think about every single organization, all of you in the room, and I'm, I'm asking you to think about the organizations you're currently in, which one of these do you think actually is the cultural trait of your organization. So I'll give you an example. At the top right, adhocracy, this is exactly the type of organization that I experienced when I went to Etihad Airlines in Abu Dhabi. But when I was working at the Just Do It company, Nike and Heineken to a certain extent, these were definitely market organizations, bottom right. Now, when I worked at uh, the European Commission, this was definitely bottom left, a hierarchy organization. I could not do at the European Commission what I did at Nike. It was impossible. I would have been a huge failure. So look at these different traits. I'm very happy to share my slides with you for this presentation. And look at these traits and identify what are the cultural uh, traits of your organization. And why is this so important? Because when you are trying to strategize on data governance and you are trying to strategize, you are also trying to, sorry, uh, make uh, operational data governance adaptive and uh, anchor it into the organization. You have to do it in a different way in a hierarchical organization as compared to a market or an ad hocracy organization. You just simply will fail. So this is why I always say to data leaders, please, please, please think about outside of the box of the toolbox of data and think about the larger disciplines of leadership in order to be a success. So that is the very, very first um, aspect of what I want to, to, to get through to you in order to make your strategies um, reality. And if you look at culture in a wider context, not just the type of organization you're in, but also the elements of that culture, every single one of those traits, be it clan, hierarchy, um, ad hocracy, or market, there are underlying components. So for example, 
if you're trying to communicate about your data governance program, or you're trying to set up some kind of structure, you need to be very mindful of the cultural trait of your organization. There are um, traits that are dysfunctional and functional. And if you know that your organization is a hierarchy and they do something dysfunctionally, you could possibly use strategies to make them function better from the ask, from the lens of data governance, and then you will be a success. So I hope that first message is clear. So moving right along, if we look at um, this, let's say the second rule that I would like to share with you uh, in order to make everything you do a success, you need to think about um, you need to be aware, sorry, you need to be aware. And what do you need to be aware of? You need to be aware that the biggest threat um, for you, so your organization to make money with data or do anything at all with data, including data governance, the biggest threat to your success actually resides in the company or the organization if you're in the government. So what am I talking about? And I really am going to spend a little time here to explain this because this is a very, very important rule. When you look at an organization, yeah, you need to be very aware of what the obstacles are. And I'm going to take you through a list of obstacles and I'm going to give you examples as well from real life. So if we look at the obstacles, your employees don't know how to manage it, meaning they don't know actually how to manage data. They don't know how to handle data because there's a misconception that data governance is about governing data. And I, I'm quoting from one of the most knowledgeable people on data governance, um, Rob Siner. He's always said, and I really believe this because I lived it at every organization, that data governance is actually about how people handle data. And I would add to that, it's about how humans and machines handle data. So what am I talking about? The data itself is what we do with it makes all the difference. And in the modern organization, it is, but it is both humans and machines that handle data. And there should be a very nice handshake between, or let's say among the different uh, human, let's say parties, departments, um, levels, uh, for example, decision makers about governance versus people who have to um, execute on the data. Um, and also machines need to execute on the data. And sometimes machines also need to make decisions. So what I'm saying is it's very, very important for people to understand that employees by definition are a lot of times through their ignorance are mismanaging or not handling data correctly. It's your opportunity to help them change that narrative. So we move on to the second one. As I just said about machines being part of the handling, the systems often block uh, the value creation or the usability or the access of data. Now, data governance actually really helps in undoing that and turning that situation around. Because once you have an agreement on how data should be handled, then everything, employees and systems, needs to fall into the fold. And there's a very, very good way for you to get that done. Your leadership are unable to squeeze value out of data. Well, if you do not have the foundations of data management in place, which includes data governance, your leadership will definitely have a lot of problems to determine how can they create value, either intangible, or tangible value. So tangible value being things like, you know, creating, um, you know, new products and services for customers um, that are generating revenue and profit in the sense of government uh, that would be, for example, making the citizens happy 
uh, here in the UAE. And I know in Singapore, it is very important. It's a high value creation. So leadership are unable to squeeze value out of data many times because foundational data practices like data governance, among other things, are just simply not in place. So we need to help the leadership. When I say leadership, executive decision makers, um, those being your peers as well, being able to do their job. And the operations are usually an obstacle, meaning the operations of your organization are just running. They have not considered utilizing the data asset nor any of the foundational data management principles um, or sorry, capabilities such as data governance to be an inherent part of the operations. It is your job to make that happen. So if you think about the operations, the growth, the innovation strategies, they simply just don't tap in. You need to be the advocate and go out and inform these people that governance is actually going to help them achieve their strategies and create the outcomes they want. Why? Because there is no single organization on the face of the earth today that can be successful without being doing uh, data well. Okay, and data as an asset is multifaceted. And as you see throughout my presentation, it is uh, an essential part of cyber compliance, customer uh, digitalization, every single topic you can think of, data is an integral part of that. Um, and then the last one I wanna speak to is your vendors. Your vendors are usually offering you, it's an obstacle, what I mean is they're an obstacle because they're usually offering you antiquated solutions that underservice it, meaning data as an asset. So if they're underservicing the data asset, it makes it very, very, very difficult for you with your data governance strategies and your operational data governance models to actually fully have an unbroken chain of data governance. So what you need to ultimately do with this particular um, rule of being aware of your obstacles, you need to walk away today and understand you must study, study these obstacles and do not try to set up a data governance model, operating model or strategy with everything in the kitchen sink in it from the get-go. You need to, what many people say in the business, you need to land on something and expand from there. Mostly if you're successful, the organization will come to you and ask you to include them in, their in your data governance operations. So this is very important. You need to you understand all this, make a map of it, and then decide what you're going to work on first. I think this is a very, very, very important uh, point. Now, if you think about um, the third area that we need to look at is um, the rule, the, the area of making sure that you are actually uh, getting everything done. So this is literally the take action area. So when you look at taking action, you first need to think about a couple of key things because otherwise you're going to fail miserably. And I'm not talking about the contexting nor understanding the obstacles. I'm talking about if you look at how can you take action, you need to look at these very specific things. And in this particular section of the presentation, I will get into quite a bit of detail. So um, uh, please uh, collect your thoughts and write down your questions because when we go through Q&A, I will very much like to elaborate on this. So when you want to start taking action, you must be able to look at do you need to actually do things yourself, right? Or do you need, do you have a budget where you can buy the best of, of breed? This is a really important thing when it comes to uh, data governance. Why? Because even if you have a very small budget, 
you can really create a lot of value. But you need to know that you have to reuse things and go run around the organization and find either solutions, people, methods, ways of working in order to actually launch your data governance in reality. Um, if you're fortunate, you have budgets and you're able to, you know, um, you know, uh, go through RFPs, uh, select some solutions, go out into the market, get people to help you. These are very relevant um, uh, aspects of deciding what your action plan is going to be and how you're going to be seen in the organization as making a difference. Um, so that's one thing. The, the second area that I want to speak about is the uh, organization structure and fit. Now, I want to talk about this also in a little bit of length, because if you look at many organizations around the world, and I've been in a lot of big organizations, I seem to remember, and it's a kind of a nightmare that's played over and over in my head, that when there's a data governance assignment, you know, to get things started, it seems that the organization is very focused and spends a lot of time fighting about this organization structure. Yeah. So in other words, where are the boxes and roles and responsibilities, but a lot about the structure, how everything fits together. And they spend a ton of time on it, let's say 80%, and they spend maybe 20% thinking about, now, what are we going to give all these people uh, to do? Like, what are all these people actually going to work on? And then it becomes a paper exercise instead of them doing strategic data governance. And it, it always amazes me. Um, they spend a ton of money. Um, the program is done and people leave. And then uh, the paper gets put in the drawer and nothing happens. And it's not just small organizations or just government or commercial, it's everywhere. So what is my advice to you on creating the organization structure and finding the right fit? My advice to you is this, please, 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 ill regard of whether or not you have an organization cultural trait of hierarchy, market, ad hocracy, or clan, know fundamentally that we are all human. And what you need to do is have an approach where you create a kind of center out structure. And what do I mean by this? There will be two principles that you have to adhere to. You push the decision-making capability as far down in the organization as possible. Why? To have the ability for quick response to resolving issues and problems. And the other thing you do is you empower people in that organization to, to be able to handle those data issues. So what do I mean by this? center out, let's say, data governance organizations, they'll have various layers, just like the ones that you've seen before that actually do nothing. But the difference here is you'll usually have at the top level, the executives dealing with more a rocky position of being informed about maybe 80% of what's going on and most of the decision and action is happening from the middle down. And that's a good thing because most organizations are a pyramid. There are less leaders than doers and big thinkers. So that means you get a lot more out of your organization. Mind you, you still have the caveat of, do I reside in a hierarchical organization or do I reside in a just do it? in a just do it, meaning market organization, you need to realize 
that it's going to be extremely bottom heavy and very, very narrow at the top. So the executives are informed almost automatically and it's just um, uh, a couple of things that they might actually need to make a decision about because that's the way those organizations work. While a hierarchical organization requires a little bit more robust decision-making um, uh, documentation trail. So I just wanna emphasize to you that this organization fits, um, do not fall into the common, uh, let's say common mistake that a lot of organizations um, you know, are, are guilty of. They actually spend way too much time at designing what I would call the cart and not thinking enough about the horse, all of the good stuff that needs to go in, which is my point number three. So with that being said, I wanted to highlight the point three and four, and then I'm going to show you some slides for point five which is actually doing the job. So on point three, this is selecting the focus area of the data governance organization. And if you have a data governance strategy, what are the, you know, the big uh, objectives and how, how, how do you materialize and state that you're actually tracking the plan and you're getting outcome? So remember we were talking about don't waste so much time on formalizing the actual structure, spend much more time on think about what these people are going to do and how they're going to do it. Well, what they're going to do, this is the time where you need to be a politician and you need to go around the organization and figure out what is the tangible thing where data governance can really make an impact. Now, data governance, again, like I said, it needs to be human-based, but it also needs to be system-based, and it needs to be a nice, clean handshake. So if you're thinking, for example, you're in a commercial organization and you're working on customer obsession, you need to make sure you peel out one part of customer obsession and implement data governance in that space. That's first things first. I also want to share with you um, one thing that I found when I was working at uh, Abu Dhabi Digital Authority, um, and this has to do with uh, an example, actually a negative example of not finding something to work on and the knock-on effect of that. So when I was working at Abu Dhabi Digital Authority, I first started, I knew that the data um, directives and the strategy had been already in place for several years, I believe at least seven years. But when I looked around and I figured out what people were actually working on, there were two things. People were speaking to operational data governance and data governance frameworks, and they were speaking to compliance to the data management standards. Now, in reality, they were speaking about both of them, but they were actually only doing compliance, meaning compliance to the uh, data governance, uh, sorry, the data management standards. They had a full operations on data, um, the data management standards. Uh, there was a third line of defense. There was a group of people who every quarter um, did a whole assessment and all the entities needed to send their evidence in and they had reporting on it. That was a great achievement for them from a compliance perspective, but here's the problem. Data management and data governance was not living truly in these organizations. Why? Because they never achieved in all that time any operational data governance model. What do I mean? People that had a role to do something, make decisions, take actions. They had no platforms for people to actually do the job. They had no um, extensive um, organization of data stewards, nor data owners, data owners that were not active. So this was really surprising to me that after all this time, they still had no rubber on the road. 
And this is something that typically happens, not just in governmental organizations, but also commercial organizations. So please do not be, you know, a victim to that. Uh, and we're going to, I'm going to give you shortly some advice, real advice on things that you can use and do to make that happen. So the fourth point, be inclusive. So what am I talking about? When we talk about data governance, a lot of times people think, oh, I have a data owner and I have a data steward and that's it. And there's some technical people over there that might do one or two things. No, you really, really need to use operational data governance, implementing, anchoring it as a, as a model, a business model into your operational organization and use data governance to pull in subject matter experts on the things, so the focus area that data governance needs to be, uh, make an impact. So I'll take the customer obsession strategy again. Let's say you're doing um, customer sentiment analysis, and that's a big area for your customer obsession. So you make sure the people who are involved in various departments of your organization, you, you um, engage them, you find out what kinds of data assets are business critical to their way of working or what they would like in terms of future data. And you make agreements on what you're going to do for them now to resolve the data issues they have and what you can go and do in the future. And then you set off and you get your data stewards and your um, data owners and all the other data teams, everybody involved to interact with them and that they understand that data governance is an integral part of making their life a success and getting their outcomes. And this inclusion is something that a lot of organizations forget. It's not just the executives at the top, it's the big thinker planners and also the people on the ground that are trying to get real strategies involved. Another way you can make data governance inclusive is by ensuring that um, you uh, engage, let's say, the project portfolio, the change portfolio. So there's day-to-day -day where you have data governance interacting, but there's also the change portfolio. So for example, you might have some very large projects and programs running. No, you're not going to choose every single project and program overstretch yourself and be unsuccessful. But you could choose one or maybe two and uh, projects or programs and inject yourself into it on a particular topic and then build out from there. And this is really, really important that people understand that data governance is a real life breathing thing as a foundational piece of data management. So. Without further ado, we've just gone over the half an hour mark. I'm going to show you several slides and I'm going to talk through these examples of these slides of real life operational data governance. And why am I focusing on operational data governance and how it fits into a larger roadmap, which will be the last slide I show you on this topic. Um, it's because you need to bring data governance to life. You need to really give it arms, legs, a head. You need to be able to tell people what to do, step one, step two, step three, and let them see how it connects to end results of your organization. So you need, to, like I said, you need to bring it all together and you need to make it feel like a piece of cake literally a piece of cake to the people who are acting out and that they're acting not in, you know, with Chinese walls around them, they're acting out in a cohesive, collaborative manner. And you need to figure out the right tempo and balance. Because remember we spoke about 
the organization context, as organization cultural traits. So think about my statement here on the, on the left. Know your organization's absorption rate. This absorption rate will be anchored in the cultural traits that we discussed before, but it will also be anchored in things like how aggressive is your organization going after particular objectives? Is your organization in crisis or are they kind of sailing along? I mean, all these things factor in. However, you need to think keenly about what they can absorb. And based on that, you take the action. So now let's look at what are some of the things that you can do tangibly that will actually launch an operational data governance model, business model, real life model that you append to the organization and you evolve and adapt as the organization change. So you, what you do want to do is you want to avoid overloading the people in your organization. Remember guys, I talked to you about absorption. You know, don't assume that everybody is like this beautiful ballerina and she's got it all covered. No, give them to the absorption level they can handle. So coach them the right way. Don't overload them. Uh, likewise, uh, mentor them. So when there are issues and there are crises, you need to be able to set up mechanisms, give them knowledge bases, have um, help lines to these people so that when the axes do come, they don't get cut. This is very, very important. These are kind of the principles of when you're setting things up, you need to think about this. Now, if you think about, I'm, I'm giving you a couple of examples of focusing on a couple of key roles in the, um, the operational data governance um, model that you're setting up. Now, I did talk about SMEs, bringing them into the fold, subject matter experts. Yes, you need to do that, but you need to have a gatekeeper. <clears throat> so you need to be able to have a data steward have a, uh, a situation where they are being, they've moved away from the, the common problem of being reactive and you are actually trying to, your goal is try to help them become proactive. And the only way the SMEs, the subject matter experts are going to take your operational data governance um, business model seriously and see you as a value creator to them is if you're able to make this shift. Because typically organizations are running behind and you want your frontline people to run in the front. Now we're gonna talk about what are the different things they do, but I just want you to understand the principle of what I'm uh, explaining to you, how to design your program. So ultimately, like I said, you need to reduce, practically reduce the time wasted um, when there are um, data stewards uh, assigned to work in the operational data governance area. You need to reduce that time. Why? Because you have to understand these people probably have another day job and they're doing this on the side if you are just setting it up. If you're not just setting it up and you're recalibrating the program, this is still true. You most people want to be able to um, be effective in everything they do. So we do need to use methods, a different knowledge base, um, some technology, uh, clear uh, priorities to get all this done. So ultimately, you need to uh, give them things like diagnostics, um, the casual uh, analysis, and how to uh, solution planning. Um, and then you also can take it a step further by doing automa automated classifications for them. So when they're looking at a data issue, they're actually helped by the knowledge base and the systems that we're giving to these people. So what am I talking about? I am talking about empowering 
data stewards. Yeah, and there are several principles of doing this. And I borrowed again here from sustainability principles and I applied them to data asset management. And what do I mean by this? Helping them reuse, repurpose, reduce, and recycle. So let's look at each of these. Reusing is reusing data expertise, like the knowledge, um, to be easily able to diagnose data problems and take action. So you're literally giving them, you know, cause and effect information, planning that out, either putting it in systems or giving them access so they can make decisions quickly. Um, you're repurposing, for example, solutions. Um, one of the examples I had is at Etihad, we repurposed a SharePoint and we made it, we turned it into a data steward portal. It was one single place where the data stewards did all of their activities, made all of their queries, and they had one place to go um, so that they can kind of control the narrative with the business and be, be seen as um, uh, really helping the business um, being able to track it, being able to report on it, and being able to show that they were making a difference. Uh, reduce. So they have um, work effort that they need to do, obviously. And if there are workflows, there are ways, of course, to automate those workflows in process automation. Now, I want to caution. You never, ever, ever, ever want to automate a broken set of processes. So you need to get their workflows correct before you take this step. This is something that you would take once things are moving. And then re recycle. So training, you would decompose and customize to provide, provide on-demand training and help while they're doing their jobs. So obviously you would train people, but you would also make it possible to train on demand. So on their screen or in a guide, they are able to maybe via an app, look up what they need to do. Now I'm gonna pick up the click because we've got about 20 more minutes before the hour. And then I wanna leave you a, a full half an hour for Q and A. So I wanted to give you an overview of enterprise data governance, what we actually did. Um, if you look out uh, in the field, people believe that you know data stewards or let's say operational data governance is a bunch of gray mouse people doing um, let's say, very mundane work. But actually, you can change that narrative and you can make sure that everything you do with governance is really purposeful. So remember I said, make sure you go out and find the different topics that are engaging for your organization and set up your governance around that. One of those or two of those topics, well, this is very, very important because at that point, you're going to be able to see that you're going to have such a high level of business alignment and also business alignment to the business priorities, nobody will question anymore the value of a foundational data management practice called data governance. They, they will not question why you need people to work on it. They will not question why you need systems set up to give the handshake that I was speaking about. So data governance, enterprise data governance has several different um, areas. Um, if you look at uh, things like, um, you know, uh, uh, business glossaries, if you look at uh, resolving data issues with people, or you look at um, some of the metadata areas, um, or any of the other data artifacts like ontologies and uh, taxonomies that are all very closely knit with data governance. So here are some practical things that we actually set up at various companies. We gave them calendars. What do I mean? We'd say, here's a way of working. We're not just talking about being proactive. You can be proactive. Here are several topics that you can be proactive. And these are examples of 
uh, proactive uh, topics such as reference data maintenance, metadata maintenance, uh, data stakeholder maintenance, uh, data quality requirements maintenance. Why do I call them maintenance? Is because things need to be kept dynamic and updated. Data stewards are dealing with the business and there's already a group of data assets that need to be uh, managed from all of these different perspectives. Those are proactive activities and we gave them a calendar, which was uh, a, reg uh, a calendar that we knew that the maintenance would be done on a frequent enough basis. Besides that, there are on-demand things like doing a rapid project intake on the right side of my screen, or they had data issues that needed to be auto-classified, or there needed to be periodic files to be exchanged. So there's different types of uh, business activity for data stewards, um, and we were able to how do you call it, break the problem down for them. We were also able to give them portals because they needed a place to do their work. Um, so they could literally just go into one place for this very big topic, even though they might not be data people, we had the chance to educate them. So on the de demand area, they could go in and see what they needed to do. Uh, in their periodic reviews, meaning they're, they're proactive, they would go in and, and be able to take and do things in a task. Um, we also gave them a wow, which is a way of working. We told them, here's your scope of work, and here are um, the different players, data owners, data stewards, and data consumers. And these are the topics that are of interest to these people. Um, data governance covers, like I had said to you, various scopes from business glossaries, from quality, data issues, metadata, and reference data. These are some of the key areas, but we were able to make dashboards, put things together, and tell them how to work on each and every one of these things. Now, you can imagine, this is huge. So we would do education as a step-by-step -step approach from a magnitude of conceptual right through to advance. We also were able to tell them, okay, these are the key first things you're going to work on uh, as a data steward. So you need to define, uh, come up with definitions of data. You need to know who's using the data. You need to know who's got access rights and manage that. You need, need to know who's producing the data and you need to know what the quality requirements are for the data. And for each of these areas, the data steward would have um, various types of uh, situations or events, and they would know what the role and responsibility is for each of these things. And these, this type of information was also programmed into systems. So remember I spoke to you about data issues we actually created a humongous catalog of common data issues. And we also made it intelligent to diagnose and index those issues. So we set up a database with this information and we categorized them into naming data, managing quality, accessing data. I mean, the list just goes on. And every one of these areas, the data steward knew that it had to do with data identification, making the data trustworthy, making the data usable, making the data move, or having the data stored. And this huge database helped data stewards who were new and new to data actually execute on their job intelligently as if they were data stewards for years. So simple mechanisms like this, which is in theory a knowledge database, helps people do their job, helps the whole organization govern data. Now, looking at the big picture, of course, I had to set up enterprise data governance plans and have roadmaps, but you need to make sure you take people along. So 
informing people who are stewards, owners, data uh, team members, uh, the consumers, the data consumers and the executives, they need to be informed that there's a bigger picture. You need to have objectives and results. They need to be tangible things that you've agreed with people. You need to track the progress. You need to have key topics that are very impactful for both business as usual and for the project portfolio. All of these things combined make you a very, very effective um, strategic data governance you know, expert and your organization will benefit greatly. So I'm going to now move on to my last topic. Um, I will try to, you know, give you a couple of also practical examples here. Um, so remember, we are talking about the rule of understanding context and the rule of being aware of your obstacles. And then the rule of please, please, please take right action. Now we're going to look at the rule of knowing your intersections in the organization. So the intersection between data governance and everything else going on in the organization and how to build bridges. Because it's important that you don't see yourself in data or data governance as an isolated thing and that it's insular and only interacting with other data capabilities like data quality or data architecting or data strategy. No, no, no. You interact with all of the above, like I just said, those are all foundational data management um, capabilities. And yes, data governance needs to also interact with analytics and data science. But what is very, very important is that you understand that the interaction, uh, sorry, the intersection between data governance as a foundational data management practice must directly interact with other things, such as the, um, we talked about the, you know, data monetization, we talked about uh, AI. AI is an example of all the strategies uh, that, uh, for example, uh, an organization uh, makes because they want to uh, compete, they want to reshape themselves, they want to restart. Many, many organizations right now, at least 85% or more, are busy trying to compete with, with you know, extreme strategies. So it's very important for you as a data leader or data responsible to understand that you need to have those touch points clearly, specifically defined. Um, so I'm gonna give you a couple of examples here. So if we look at data governance and data monetization, I'm gonna hop back and forth with my slides. Um, data monetization. So think about data value, the data value proposition. You usually find data value propositions associated with data products, which are on um, the left side, uh, sorry, the left side of my screen. So you need to make sure that when you have uh, data propositions, you have all these tangible data governance products that are appended or uh, associated with the data value proposition in your company. So I'm not gonna use the customer one, I'll use the digital the digitalization strategy. Many organizations have a digitalization strategy. And if you think about digitalization, it's in multiple areas. So for example, the obvious one is many companies digitalize the operate the core uh, uh, processes in a company. And so they automate um, and they digitalize those processes. Um, but there are other companies that are more advanced in digitalization and they use digitalization to create great products and services for their customer, for example. All of the above is digitalization. But here's the thing, you have data governance products that should be associated with 
digitalization to create new products and services for your customer, but also helping to, um, you know, automate uh, or digitalize core processes for the organization. So you can append these real products from data governance to any of these types of digitalization efforts. This is very, very important. Besides that, you also have on the right side data governance services that you can also um, collaborate with the digitalization teams in order to um, ensure that the data that is uh, you know, underwriting the digitalization effort is also at the maturity level handled correctly so that the digitalization efforts are as successful as possible. So you actually don't realize it, but you have two different types of data governance products and services available to you to underpin the work you do and show the value you bring to the table. Then there's, of course, um, you know, if you look at monetization and, and data value propositions, you have real business cases to make, for example, a project, um, project effectiveness better. Now, underpinning all of these, you know, business things that people want to get at, you can see how some of these, like I'll take the yellow one here, reduce data reusage or a better target marketing per region, you need to be able to think, how can I again use data governance products and services to actually affect something in a business case? It's a lot of work. It's not just, okay, I bring out a business glossary and I'm done. You need to literally inject yourself to the lifeblood the revenue streams, the profitability, the in the innovation, the growth, the compliance, the cyber, every topic, you need to inject data governance. So I'm going to move on now to another topic, yeah, uh, of data governance and AI. So first of all, I'm a true believer in semantic AI being... Um, you know, the way to go when it when you talk about AI. Uh, what do I mean by that? So it's literally putting data in context uh, um, and making data understandable for people. So if I say, uh, let me think, if I say uh, white, what does it mean to you? But if I say a white, white is the color of the mouse that I'm using to navigate my screen, guess what? I just put data, white, in context. So it's understandable to you as a human, but also to a machine. That is what I mean when I say semantic. Semantic data is putting data in context. This is of critical importance when we want to use the strategy of AI. So. Why is data governance so important if you are trying to go to market with AI and you're trying to do it in an intelligent way, semantic AI? Because if the data is not governed, handled by humans and machines correctly from the inception of thinking about what data assets we want, and data stewards being involved with uh, subject matter experts to ensure that things are handled from the thinking part, uh, right through, carried through our systems where the machines start handling the data as well as we're producing the algorithms or recalibrating the algorithms or using the outcome from the algorithms. Can you see what I'm saying? end-to-end -end data governance is mission critical. Inject yourself into every AI project and you will be a star. So come out of the gray mouse area of you know, governance or compliance and start injecting yourself into semantic AI. And 
uh, building on the foundation of data governance. So with that said, I think I've come up to the hour. So my key takeaways are know your context, borrow from other disciplines and understand what organizational uh, cultural traits are in your organization. Understand how your organization is maybe dysfunctional for its key, uh, key traits. And if you could bring them back to functional, what would be the contribution of data governance in order to affect that success? And ensure that you understand that keenly so that you don't make a misstep and you know put your program off into the wrong direction. The second point or rule was know your obstacles. So thinking about your employees, your leaders, the vendors, the operations, and the systems, understand keenly how are these obstacles in your organization. Draft it out, do your analysis, and carve out the topics and the areas that you feel you can launch or restart your data governance programs. And then narrow it down to those optic obstacles that impact that particular topic, and then be able to put it in the right context. And then the third area is take action. So again, know your budget, know also the key topics, be inclusive, know who needs to be included at this moment right now, and who should be included for the next step and the next step so that you can lobby. Uh, make sure that your organization structure fit is not taking up 80% of your time. If you're getting dragged into meetings, you shut it down and take control and give people something to work on. Even if your organization is very bureaucratic, try to see if you can get people to do a day in the life session where you act out um, how to do data governance and you try to fine tune the, the model. These are kinds of things that you can do. And then the fourth thing is building bridges. So understand the intersections that are mission critical right now in your organization. If your organization is really focused on uh, data, uh, sorry, on AI, know that you can play a key role in it. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention about AI is you also have the inter two intersections happening at the same time. You've got data governance with AI in general, and you have date you have data and AI ethics that are two different, let's say, sides of the same coin, but are really mission critical so that anything you do with AI is a success. So think about how data governance can also help build the bridge between data and AI ethics in making AI a success for your organization. Um, so with that being said, I would really like to thank you for the listening to my drone <laughs> for the last hour. And I really hope that you've come up with a couple of insightful questions or just, you know, um, feel that you can leave this session and actually pick up some of the um, tangible things that I shared with you in making strategic data governance impactful um, and have at the same time operationalized data uh, governance organizations really um, acting, being seen, being valued by the rest of the organization. And I thank you for listening and I open up the mic and uh, we'll shut down the presentation to take your questions. Oh, I'm not hearing you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm sorry. The Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I can hear you. So anyway, uh, thank you, Akhya. I think we now know what professional uh, data governance and data management looks like. Yes. So uh, thank you, Akhya. It's, it's always good to see a high bar. Now, <laughs> now we're all like, you know, scared. <laughs> no, no, no. I want you guys to say something, anything, okay. um, but, any okay. question, any question. Uh, questions, please. I'll uh, just give us some amazing insights. Uh, I took on so many notes. I got two pages of notes there. Uh, please ask questions. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Speak now. Just come up front. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah, I think I'll just then. Yeah, Hi. Me. My name is Ashraf. I come from the maritime industry, more on the uh, digital segment of the maritime industry. So you yes. were saying in Abu Dhabi, um, you know, compliance, I mean, the governance was just part of the compliance and it's more like a, you're trying to operationalize compliance. So yes. my question, when you work across in, I work in a maritime, uh, in a company where there's 53 offices globally. And sometimes in some offices, um, governance just become it's always just a paper exercise towards compliance. Yes, right. Operationalizing uh, governance is always a difficult task. Yeah. So what taken? Uh, because you know we had CDO who come and go all the time, uh, because they weren't able to operationalize governance. Yes. Yeah, I understand. So first of all, thank you very much. Um, it's interesting that you started the questioning. Um, one of the things that I'm working on here in um, in Abu Dhabi, and recently I had the pleasure of, of working with uh, an African organization that's engaging, it's in the maritime, in the maritime area. So I recently kind of got to know a little bit more about maritime business, shipping lines and ports and all of that, and also speaking to um, Abu Dhabi uh, port group which is a fascinating area. So uh, hats off to you. It's a really complex area. So what you just said is indicative of not just the marine sector, it's many sectors. So if you heard what I said regarding strategy, you will never become strategic if you're not viewed as adding value. So um, if you remember in my presentation, I spoke about a... Uh, how do you call it, a di uh, intelligent diagnostics um, on data issues. Um, I'd be more than happy to pull up the slide to show you, because I think this is a really practical thing that you need to, to know. Just one moment. This one, was it this one? Yes, it was this one. Um, let me make my screen. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. This is not the right slide. This one. Uh, sorry, I'm not, I didn't get your name. What was your name? Uh, my name is Ashra. So um, does Ash would do Ash. Ash. Okay, Ash. A very practical thing. Uh, let's take, if you said you're in the marine business, let me just ask you, what's one Let's say you have three big core components of the organization. Would it would ship shipping, ship line business, and port management be part of the key business pillars? Just give me an example of a key business pillar. Let's talk through this problem. Um, I think if for us, at least what I'm relating to is actually data management within the cloud infrastructure. No, no, what I'm asking you, what I'm asking you is what is a key business pillar, a key business area of your business? Can you on tell board, me? Yeah. On board ship, on board ship uh, technology. Uh, ship sorry, ship, ship, ship technology. technology. Yeah, ship okay. technology. Okay, tell me a second big area of your business, a big business area. Defense, defense technology. Advanced technology? Maritime defense technology. Okay. Now, 
Um, where, what, in between the two you just gave to me, which of the two areas, which area would you say has the biggest issues with data and information, the biggest confusion? Yeah, then the ship maritime ship technology. The ship technology, okay. Yes. The ship technology, could you break that down into uh, three or four or even five areas, like key components? Yeah, that's simple. Um, navigation, communication, engine system, uh, data infrastructure, and probably a communication system. Okay. So if you broke that down, you see what I'm doing? I'm doing a business diagnostic. I'm not even talking about data yet. So I'm breaking down the business and I'm asking you to tell me for, let's say, any of those five areas, where do you guys have the most problem, the most opt obstacles with data? And if you could answer that question, then we would go and create one of these. What I mean is a diagnostic on, on the different types of data problems that you would have. Do you understand what I mean, Ezra? No. No or yes? I couldn't hear you. Yeah, I think the navigation system because there's so many uh, suppliers within the navigation system. It's all okay. Like a... Okay, so what would be, okay, if you've got a lot of suppliers in a particular system. You're, yeah. What are the kinds of problems are you having? Are you having problems identifying the vendors? Uh, not really. I think they have a different say, standardization structure. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Standardization. Yeah. Right. So you need, so you're having issues with, is it their reference data that they're using to name things? Yeah. They usually have proprietary data. Okay. So they're proprietary data. So there's the conversion so people can understand it. Um, and then be able to use, uh, understand it, use it to be able to do their job. This is where you're having a bottleneck, correct or not? You can see that one of it, yeah. <laughs> okay. What I'm, what I'm doing with you is I'm breaking down the business problem and I'm finding the intersection between what the business problem is and what are the related data issues. We could continue doing this exercise, maybe uh, four more leaps, and we would get to a point where we could decide, based on the description of the problem, we could decide where do you have a, a data issue? Is it an identification? Is it not trustworthy? Is it not usable or accessible? Is it in the movement of the data? Is it in the storage of the data? This is literally looking at the data lifecycle but it's talking to it from your perspective as the business. This is what the data people and the data governance people need to be able to do in order to be a partner to the business. And then take the knowledge of what is the problem, the issues, put this in knowledge databases and make it possible for data stewards and other governance people to work with the business to resolve these problems. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. And there are business cases associated with each of these business problems. So it is a business problem. There is a, a cost, uh, there's risk, uh, exposure, uh, and there are potential benefits that are left on the table. Just as an example, there might also be compliance risks associated with these things. This is how, um, I'm just going to take that away. This is how uh, a data governance, sorry, data governance as a, as a capability can directly impact the day-to-day -day operations and even the bottom line of the commercial organization. Ask the data management issue. I'm sorry? Sounds to me like a master data management issue. It would be like a master, yes, it could be master data. That I do feel some reference data and even metadata issues. But the business doesn't care about that terminology. It's for the, the data stewards and the data teams to be able to break down uh, and diagnose the problem within our expertise. 
but we first need to understand what's the intersection with the business and what pain is it causing? What is it and what pain is it causing? And it could be multifaceted, meaning a vendor giving proprietary names or a vendor not giving a common data model so you don't understand how the data interacts with each other. There are many problems, many problems. Have I answered your question on how to peel the onion? <laughs> Yeah, I think to a certain level, yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> tell me what level I have. There's many, prob there many problems, right? so I think you have answered. Okay. okay. <laughs> I don't like to eat the rest of <laughs> Thanks, Alvin. You're welcome. Thanks. I'd be happy to help you out further if you have any questions. <laughs> okay, somebody else? I always hear on the left side of the room. What's going on with the right side? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Alpha Shrivasta. I work with MasterCard as a director for acceptance uh, digital acceptance. Uh, one of the things that was interesting at the end, maybe more later at, at the end of the. I'm not sure. Oh. I, it, it's <laughs> Uh, I'm not hearing you, Bill. And you just need to slow down your speech because the audio breaks off. So I'm missing half of what you're saying. Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> What's your name? What's your name again? My name is Abhinav Shirvasta. And okay. I work with MasterCard. MasterCard. Okay. Uh -huh. Abhi. Abhi is good. <laughs> Abhi. 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 And you work with MasterCard. Okay. Great. Uh, my question was more towards the later part of the conversation when you started uh, discussing about also the, you know, invent of in AI and all those things coming in in our conversations more often, yes. right? And mm -hmm. data is playing some role with it. Uh, I would like to understand how is the governance structure that you guys are envisioning, especially when there are models being utilized to put the generative AI in front of people based yes. on the learning of the existing data sets. And that may yeah. even result into hallucination a lot of time from the AI models. I and they're creating some inevident uh, out outcomes for the people who are associated to that data. So how do right. you structure those things and what, what type of governance model do you advocate in those kind of scenarios? Right. So there's there's what you just explained to me is like a big cake with different components in it. So... First of all and foremost, um, when you talk about you know putting generative uh, AI in front and creating different illusions, there needs to be a way to check if those like the illusions or the things that it's saying um, are actually things that are uh, relevant, right, um, meaningful uh, or true, right? So so you need to do like multiple scenario testing. So think about if you're scenario testing, wouldn't you need some governance around that in terms of controlling the, the terminology and controlling um, the way people handle and process it? So that's where I see governance can play a role in that specific problem that you explained. But overall, overall, end to end, if you heard what I was explaining about semantic AI, Semantic AI puts data in context in the very beginning. So if you say in the very beginning of this process, I've got a data set that I believe is relevant, you need to already handle and manage that data. That's governance, right? So right terminology, right reference, all of that. As you go through and you start processing that data, you need to have a track record of what have we actually done, right? So how have I aggregated? How have I transformed? Those are all part of audit trail. Sorry, go ahead, ask the question. So uh, again, I'm just trying to contextualize it based on what we have been going through at least for the last yesterday yeah. and today. Uh, yeah. and, and, and there was a specific thing about how do you identify who is the owner of a particular you know, governance model? Governance, so basically the governance is stewards, right? So who are these yes. going to identify the steward as an owner for a particular thing? Right. When you're talking about a generative uh, data, yeah, to make these stewards accountable for things which they are not control of. Oh yeah, I get what you're saying. This is a whole, it's like a whole next level. So 
in the situation where you again it's generative right it's been created we need to give let's say i wouldn't say another ownership but another identity to that creation because you can't say that you know a, a data steward went out and expressly created that that's a human they haven't done that so it needs to be attributed to a new group right a new group which is this kind of intelligence um and it needs to be given an identity it needs you you understand what i mean it needs to be given an identity it needs to be given a role and it needs to be identified in terms of what it has deducted and advised that needs to be in itself scrutinized get me with governance people because they have a role just like you and i or uh I don't know, let's say a dumb computer that's been given a simple task. <laughs> so I just, you understand there's different roles. No, I'm, I'm, following, yeah, I'm completely following on that note. And then to be honest, uh, uh, given the scenario, we would potentially try to do that. But again, as a business, you would want to make a human accountable for whatever comes out. Right, so, right. Weird pause in the you know in the structure i think that's what i was look, i'm, I'm looking uh, for okay so that's at a higher that's a, as a supervisory role so as a super let's say as a custodian let's put it that way of this generative yes some human needs to be accountable for what this generative uh, ai is doing so this is exactly my point there needs to be you need to be able to link it back to a group or a person um, and those people, just like I was talking about the data steward earlier, you need to give them tools, methods, ways of controlling that situation. So, so there needs to be sports, extra work. There needs to be extra work to supervise. Do you understand what I mean? They're not doing it. They have. Uh, think about the compliance role I was talking about earlier. They need to supervise and not like periodically once every quarter but if this thing is generating think about how dynamic it is do they need on-demand observation and controls do you see what i'm saying we have to design for what is we can't look only at you know the way we used to do things because the cycle was really long now the cycle is milliseconds so if i'm a supervisor of some generative ai I need a whole bunch of not just technology, but mechanisms to control that. And I need alerts that this thing has gone off and done something that maybe I don't think is okay. So there needs to be a lot of thought put into what those control mechanisms would be, just like I showed um, your colleague, the data issue mechanism. You would need ones for, um, you know, like think about exception reporting, you know? Or, hey, this is in the red zone. If it goes into this, <laughs> turn it off, plug it off. I mean, seriously, because this is something that's evolving and yeah. we need time to respond, right? We need we need to be able to control it. So again, I, I'm i supervisor. Um, the, the the lady behind you on your on your left is on your left, your other left <laughs> is the generative AI. She's going off and she's doing all sorts of things. And you are saying, I'm the supervisor. I want to have these controls in place. Uh, alert me on how she's doing within this range. Alert me if she goes outside of this range. Uh, here's a constant monitoring and assurance of yeah, quality and performance. We need to give the supervisor that role. We need to literally create that. And that's not something that's been here forever. That's something that's being developed right now. All I'm telling you is wisdom from any party should have a role and ability to act, right? And they have requirements. So now your new requirement is how can I observe while not being right there? And she's moving quick. So I need to move as quick as she's moving. Yeah. It's, it's like principles. It's principle day. It's, I know it's hard to design, but it is possible. I appreciate that. Thank you. Did I help you at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, no, I think we're on the same page. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming forward. Uh, one more last question, somebody? 
phone from the line from you. Remotely, anybody? Is he yelling at the camera? Um, and no, Mark, you already the provided insights were uh, very informative. But uh, thanks to Althea for such a very informative uh, session. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, let me let me. I have a question, uh, Althea. Yeah, sure. Top of what you've been saying, the the a lot of that spotlight is going to be on the data steward, right? Yes, 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 and there's good reason. There's good reason. I heard a, we had a, a presentation uh, in a different context uh, from the individual the government uh, uh, organizations where the, the main data steward made a presentation in front of 25 CIOs. Mm -hmm. After four of them offered her a job. Right? And the problem was they said that there's no way I can find a data steward like that. And then the question that Mom was, are data stewards born or bred? Ah, okay. They can be bred. They can. But they, um, I did a presentation on this, oh my gosh, way back in 2010. They need to have innately a kind of a couple of qualities. Um, Absolutely, data stewards need to be open-minded and extremely learned because think of what this last gentleman just explained. Oh my God, to help design that, you know, that's that's a lot of work, right? You got to think, really open up your mind. Um, data stewards need to be, I believe as well, um, just out of their nature. Um, I don't want to use the term inclusive, but they... They need to be really good to independently act and at the same time work very well in, in teams because their teams are always changing, right? So they have to be like chameleons, people who are very adaptable, really. Um, it, it doesn't matter if they come from the business, IT, or data. Honestly, it doesn't really matter. It will help if they come from the business because they might understand the data steward better, but that's not to say that an IT or a data person doesn't understand business models and can't pick them up well. So in my mind, I understand why they offered her the job. You know, I understand because that's, it's very, you have to be very versatile to be a data steward. However, the good news is, I think a lot of people are looking for versatility in their roles. It gets boring doing the same thing. Hey, I, I get bored real easy. So I just I, I I would go for it. But you need to also be um not faint at heart, you know, not take everything personally and and really just plow through, really plow through for the greater good. Thank you, Alpia. Okay, uh that's about 430 our, our time. Uh, yes. Last question before we let Althea get for her lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do I get some questions from any of the ladies in the room? Okay. Ah, I see some smiles. <laughs> come on, come on. Come on, at least one or two ladies. <laughs> come on, I see somebody wanting to put their hand up, but I don't. Hello. I can't hear her. I'm sorry. I can't hear you, my dear. Uh, hi, I'm Eden from uh, Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. And um, hi, hello. Yeah, hi. So seriously, I don't really have a question, but since you so directed, I know I just want to I, I just want to share that I think there's quite a lot to digest in this aspect. So I um I find it a challenge, but I do resonate well with the last statement you have made about um getting bored that it comes with the character of the people because mm -hmm. uh, um aside a CISO role recently. And I find that um, there's a lot of challenge and 
if you don't want to take on the challenge and you don't you are you are those that actually uh needs to be very process driven in a certain aspect that you need all the process to be stated out. I think the, the, the aspect is that you will have issues dealing with such challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I can resonate well why you say that you need to plow through and then just to get then things done. So, yeah. so I will just say that uh, you have shared a lot. There's quite a number of things I need to digest and take it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then hopefully it's useful in, in my career for my next I uh, mean, my current role now. Yeah. Great. And you're in cyber. You're in cyber, you said? Yes, yes, correct. Yeah, there's a lot of data in cyber. So <laughs> a lot to be covered. So all right. the best. Thank you for standing up. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. For, for spending time with us. All right. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I'm hoping to get back to Singapore soon. My stepson lives there for years and it's, he keeps on saying, when are you guys coming? But, you know, with the COVID, it's kind of made things crazy. But I really hope to be soon there. You come next time, I will pick it up. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to it. Thank you. All Thank right. you for the moderator. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.